You're listening to Storytime in Paris on Paris Underground Radio. For more great content and to join our book club, please join us on Patreon. Since well before Victor Hugo looked up at Notre Dame and thought, huh, what if a hunchback lived in there? Authors have been inspired by Paris. Welcome to the Storytime in Paris podcast on Paris Underground Radio, where we keep that tradition alive by showcasing an author with a French connection in each episode. Every episode will feature five questions asked by you, our author's biggest fans, and answered live on air. Then our authors will treat us to a reading of an excerpt from their book. I'm your host, Jennifer Garrity. Would you like to join the Storytime in Paris book club? Head on over to patreon.com slash Paris Underground Radio and stay tuned to the end of this episode for more information. My guest this week is award-winning author Jordan Stratford, whose latest novel, La Maupin, is the second in his new Sword Girl historical YA series. La Maupin is based on the true story of 17-year-old Julie Aubigny, who lived in the 17th century and became a wife, lover, nun, assassin, arsonist, grave robber, expert swordswoman, and opera superstar, all before her 18th birthday. Jordan's tale is described as a blend of French yee pop, 1980s Della Corda Beach novellas, and Luc Besson films. Without further ado, please allow me to introduce Jordan Stratford, author of La Maupin. Hi, Jordan. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me. So can you start by telling us a little bit about who you are and what you do? Yeah, my name's Jordan Stratford, and um, I'm better known as an author of middle grade fiction for girls. I have a series with Penguin Random House called uh, The Wollstonecraft Detective Agency, which I started about 10 years ago. We did four books in that series and turned into a video game, and there's a TV series in development. But I started writing Young Adult a couple of years ago, and I pitched a series called Sword Girl that was about teenage warrior women through the ages. And I started with a, a Viking story, 9th century, Vlad Gertha from the Tales of Saxo Grammaticus, which is literally just a Saxon guy who can write. But he, that's just where we get all the, the stories of Ragnar Lothbrok and all the, the Viking stuff comes from it. And um, Vlad Gertha was, uh, or Lada in the book, she was a military commander and she was a shield maiden. And she became the admiral of the largest fleet that Europe would see until the Spanish Armada. So I, I have her story as a, as a teenager caught in the middle of civil war, who finds herself kind of the de facto queen of a united Norway. And so moving forward in time, I've always been fascinated by this, this amazing character, uh, Julie Lamopin. And she was born effectively with a sword in her hand. Her father was responsible for hiring the sword instructors for the musketeers. So she grew up in a cell. She grew up around fencing masters. Uh, she grew up around horses. And Versailles was pretty much built around her. When the palace moved from, from Paris proper into Versailles, she was a toddler. And so she just grew up around construction. And the king, of course, you know, had weaponized architecture, had weaponized fashion. You could only get an audience if you were wearing this season's colors. Uh, which bankrupted, like he would loan the money to families to buy fashion that you needed to get access. And so he had people mortgage off their estates, mortgage off their, their family homes, mortgage off their titles. So the king held all this debt so that people would buy the right clothes so they could get an audience with him. And he used this to control the nobility from the fact that he had staved off plots to overthrow him from childhood. And then he incentivized uh, a bunch of these guys saying, hey, you guys are already up to your eyeballs in debt. I will erase these debts. If you move to New France, like move to Quebec and colonize exotic places like Detroit, uh, <laughs> and, and then you'll be debt free. And he did this through weaponizing fashion. So she grew up you know, not only with a sword in her hand around horses, but also with this very strong sense of the role of fashion, the role of performance. She was a palace daughter, so she lived in this sprawling complex that was the whole, with you know, Versailles was the center of the universe, constantly under renovation, and uh, with this very strong sense of expectation, performance, and as she calls it, that her job is to be the shiniest apple on the cart. And 
she gets to a point in her life where she starts to realize the power of her femininity coupled with her skill as a swordswoman. And she steps into her own, her own self and her own identity as this pansexual cross dressing arsonist nun swordswoman who was the last woman under French law to be sentenced to be burned to death at the stake. And she talked her way out of it. So you know, she's always been this incredibly compelling character. And uh, at this great moment in history, this great juncture of history, you know, she gets married off to her dad's boss because she, or sorry, she, she has an affair with her dad's boss. She becomes the mistress of her dad's boss, gives her some, some leeway over, you know, her, her father's scrutiny, but you can't just be a mistress. You know, you, you can't have an unmarried mistress. It's, you know, tying up loose ends. So she gets married to this kind of poor elderly tax collector off in the countryside whom she spends zero time with. And she just is delighted by everything. She's delighted. She loves food. She loves marzipan. She is an alcoholic. And um, she gets drunk and stabs people. And so she is in an era where everybody has to learn how to use a sword. And using a sword is a crime. So everybody has to learn how to duel. But dueling is illegal. And the reason why dueling is illegal is because you end up chewing through the elderly or through, sorry, through the oldest sons of noble families at an astonishing rate, because in an era before antibiotics, you get a decent scratch with the tip of a rapier, and it's going to get infected, and you're going to die. So you may have killed the other guy first, but you're going to be dead in a week anyway, because there's a lot of horse poop lying around, and you know tetanus is a horrible way to go. So you know there we have it. So that's kind of the whole thing in a nutshell. And dueling is popular, but illegal. Everybody knows how to do it, and no one's allowed to do it. And so it's in this milieu that that we find uh, Julie, who just wants to dance and she wants to sing. She's a you know she's a, a trained opera singer. She's a trained ballet dancer, but she's also a swordswoman. And I'm going to cue up a bit from the book later. But she, while she is the mistress to one guy, married to another guy, she falls for a dashing young sword instructor who is there to adjudicate a duel. Things go south. People are dead. She has to. She's on the lam, and goes to Marseille is abandoned by her lover, brokenhearted. She falls in love with this girl from a noble family. The noble family bungs the girl in a convent in shame. So Julie, our heroine, cuts her hair and becomes a nun so she can sleep with the girl she likes. <laughs> <laughs> so, And this is all true. I mean, this is all happening when she's 16, 17, and you're really taking your own destiny in your hands. And doing it so adeptly. I mean, she's this sort of beautiful goddamn disaster of a person. And she's so she's so compelling that uh, Bram Stoker, author of Dracula, really wanted to write a book about her. But he couldn't get over the fact that she was such a complex, and to his mind, horrifying character. You know, her wanton criminality. And this is just, you know, what made her so terrifying to Stoker was here's a teenage girl who does exactly what she wants. She kisses who she wants, she stabs who she wants, she drinks as much as she wants, and he just couldn't wrap his head around what a powerful human being that made her. And, you know, this is the guy who cranked out monsters, and he just couldn't deal with the fact of a young woman in her own power. That was scarier to him. And so there's that's Julie in a nutshell. Yeah, she's a fascinating character, and it's true that when you're reading it, you're like, how is this... How is this a true story? How could all of this happen in such a short period of time to one teenager? But I want to ask you before we get too much into that, what is your connection to France? Do you have one yourself? You know, if, uh, like a lot of people, I backpacked in Paris as a teenager, fell in love with the place and um, have been back a few times over over the years. Everybody has a little, their, their favorite uh, cafe. I walked, you know, in, in Henry Miller's footsteps around Clichy and I have a little espresso cup from the Procope that I think I stole, honestly. I feel bad, <laughs> I feel bad now. I think I stole that. Um, so, yeah, Paris is, is marvelous. I think that everyone has gone there has fallen in love with it to, to some extent, whether you're you know, on, the, on the tourist path or you, um, you're just, just wandering around. So it's not so much the, the history in this kind of canned sense that compels me, but just the little hidden stories you know, there's a there's a cafe in in the book that dates from that period that was the artists, kind of the bohemian uh, artistic circles of Paris at the time. 
you know, we're talking in the late 1600s, it's still there. <laughs> you know, uh, there's still sugar on the floor from, from, <laughs> from coffee. So it becomes a kind of a, an important social hub really for the third act of the book. Yeah. Yeah. I was just walking past there the other day and I was like, oh, I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> So Le Maupin, it's the second book in the Sword Girl series, as you mentioned to us. What is it that drew you to these stories of these swashbuckling women throughout history? Two two reasons. One is uh, I'm a sword nerd. I'm a I'm a I'm a HEMA nerd, historical European martial arts guy. So I've been a sword guy for a long time, and I have a collection of sharp and shiny things. And I spent my 20s stabbing my friends in the head, which is a great way to relax. <laughs> and it's why, you know, now that I'm in my 50s, my knees are shot. But, you know, I've, I've always been a sword nerd. And the reason why I kind of unearthed this, in this idea of, of doing a, a YA series was, was kind of twofold. One is having done middle grade for girls. Part of it is, is as the years go by, my readers age out. And there are things that you can do in middle grade or that you can you can't do in middle grade that you can do in YA. So obviously if you're writing for for 12 year olds, people can't get stabbed. There can't be jeopardy. Nobody can can be about to die you know, as well as any kind of adult content. So the the biggest thing that you can imperil in middle grade is somebody's feelings. That there's a lot of validity to that because you know when you're 11, 12 you're figuring out social capital, you're figuring out emotional cues. In YA, I think that we forget in an era of shortened lifespans that for a lot of people, 16 was practically middle-aged, <laughs> you know, at 16, you are a grown ass adult. You're expected to be independent or, you know, in, in many cases for women, you know, married off having children in many periods of history, you were going to war. You know, we still see a, a, a kind of a common married age for people, you know, 2021, 20, but for much of of uh, modern history since the Renaissance through the modern era, we do see a lot of older teens going to war, having families, clearing land, planting farms and, and paving their own way. So we have a, a whole, obviously uh, patriarchy. Let's blame patriarchy. This is why we have all of these stories and we know what the men were up to, but there are these fascinating points of view from women it's just these are stories that, that don't get told you know do we really need another robin hood story you know <laughs> there's like that would be cool but do we really need another one do we need another you know king arthur so with my interest in history and my interest in sword play and seeing this fondness for underrepresented or, or underloved stories it's a great place to, to dive in and so why settled on, on them because she's always been such a fascinating character but what really drove this particular book is I had this fixation as a younger reader with the Delacorta novels, which were these kind of trashy beach reads that were just French pop culture and yeah, yeah, pop and this kind of beach candy. So even though I wrote, I'm writing this historical novel set in the 17th century, I really wanted to be do a kind of a love letter to how... French culture reinvents itself, is delighted by itself. And she's such a great POV to embody that. Yeah, absolutely. Will all the heroines in your books be teenagers? Yeah. Okay, interesting. So th yeah, this is kind of where uh, I definitely wanted to have it rooted in, in YA and where it's older teens, 16, 17, 18, 19, finding their own agency through combat. And, you know, I've identified five more to do these. I've got two out with Outland Entertainment, outlandentertainment.com. There's your plug. <laughs> and so the first is called Winter by Winter, and the second is simply La Maupin. Curious about what's going on in Paris right now? My second podcast, Don't Miss This, takes you beyond the typical and the obvious with a weekly roundup of the best of what's happening in Paris each week. Never wonder what you're missing out on again. Listen now to Don't Miss This on ParisUndergroundRadio.com or wherever you listen to podcasts. We'll be right back with Storytime in Paris after a word from our sponsors. And now, back to Storytime in Paris. Can you tell us a little bit about the research that you did for La Maupin? Absolutely. 
we are definitely living in a, a gilded age for historical research because if I want to see a button on a uniform, it's there. If I want to see a particular sword, it's there. If I want to see, you know, not what Versailles looks like today, not what it looks like in 1860, not what it looks like in 1760, but if I'm looking for 1682 precisely, I can see a floor plan because, you know, Versailles was constantly being reinvented, remodeled. Again, this weaponization of fashion and you know, nothing was nothing was finished. It was just under constant, constant construction and renovation. So being able to get everything from clothes to weapons to maps to how long does it take on horseback to get through Pont de Boulogne? Uh, you know, what are the main paths like? What are you likely to see? What's Marseille looking like? What's the, what are the political influences of the day? Who the good guys are, the bad guys? You know, there are there are many well-known figures in the book. And so it's also in the the shadow of things like the affair of the necklace, which is this sort of wonderful poison, uh, satanic panic of the era with, you know, there's literally, you know, there's a diamond necklace and there's black magic and there's people being poisoned and, you know, and that's cool in itself. And in the wake of that and the paranoia around that, this girl grows up. And so there's a, the, the foil, the villain in the, in the book is the, the chief of police in, in Paris who is, constantly trying to recruit her for murder purposes and she doesn't want to work for anybody <laughs> she's like if i murder somebody it's just going to be because that you know the guy had it coming so there's definitely a uh, la femme de quita nod there so there's a kind of a uh, in terms of the pacing of the book i wanted it to feel like a Besson film and uh, you know there's there's definitely a uh, like i said a yeah yeah pop soundtrack <laughs> and uh and a pulp de la corta vibe yeah, definitely. And in in all of this, in this crazy adventure that she creates, goes through, lives through, she seems quite uh, cunning and charismatic, and maybe a little uh, hot tempered. How did you get into her mindset? Like, do you have any I don't know, rituals? How do you get into the mindset of a 17 year old girl in 17th century France? Yeah, that it, that was really interesting. And I, I think of a lot of it as, as a father of a daughter, you know, looking at my daughter's friends, looking at her social influences, and, you know, even literally the people that she's following on social media, that that persona of, of, of ownership. So I really kind of saw Julie as as a pioneer in this regard of of agency, of autonomy, owning her look, owning her style, owning her actions. But at the same time, you know, she's, she's a, a, a dumpster fire. I mean, this girl's a hot mess. But but spectacularly so. I refer to her in the setup to the book as a sugar frosted hand grenade. You know, she's she's fun. So I really wanted to keep keep her fun and engaging. But even just looking at the bare bones of her story, if you look at a chronology of what actually happened to this young woman, this point, then this point, then this point, then this point, then this point, which all of which happens in a span of about two and a half years. How she goes from shy palace daughter to to being a mistress, to being a wife, to being a runaway, to being a nun, to being an arsonist, to being a wanted woman, to being a murderess, to being arrested, and and then you know finding her way back into palace life, and then becoming the biggest pop star of her age. You know, she was the biggest. She was the first contralto to have an opera written for her. She was uh, she was the Madonna of her age. And so there's definitely that kind of 80s pop vibe that I wanted to, to weave into this story as well. You know, when she decides she wants to go back to theater, when she, she arrives back in Paris after being a wanted woman and living on the road, she realizes that the theater that she wants to work in and that she wants to audition for is actually on the property that her husband owns. Like she forgets this guy. She's like, oh, right. No, actually, I, I'm in charge. And so she just sort of shows up with this sense of I'm, I'm taking over now. But um, between you know, being on the road and misadventure and heartbreak and her, her struggle with alcohol, it lands her in a lot of trouble. And she very pragmatically is constantly you know, dealing with the crises that you know, is putting out the fires as she starts or dealing with the aftermath and, and running away. 
Yeah, there are definitely times when I wanted to yell at her, like, no, don't do that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, you, you can do that with a totally fictional character, right? You can you can make them stop, but when each step each, you know, it's like a knot in a piece of string. Each thing is a, is, is part of the historical record. Like she actually went and did this right there. And we know the names of the people involved. So there are witnesses. Well, you sort of just answered this, but I'm so fascinated. So she started with this really like from a good family, well to do. She has many falls from grace. She's living sort of in the woods in old clothes and fending for herself. And yet then she becomes this famous opera singer in the end. How was she able to move so fluidly between these different social classes? And how was she perceived by the people around her? She, she disguised herself as a boy on uh, numerous times with, with great success. So although she spent most of her time among the upper classes and found that there was, was currency. So because she knew everything, you know, her family lived and died by fashion at a time of, you know, while, while the King created stability, there's a lot of chaos that, that swirled around him and he delighted and he used that chaos and weaponized that chaos around him. So things were always changing and she used the currency that she had as a palace daughter that when she was in Marseille, she was like, Oh, you guys don't actually know how to throw a party. Like, Oh, that's cute. That's so last. And so she has this, like, I will tell you, I will show you what the dances are this year. I'll show you what the colors are this year. I'll show you the things that I like. And so she just kind of became this, this kind of style icon because she had the inside track to what's hot at the palace this year. And so she, she leveraged that currency and then drops off all of that to become a nun. <laughs> <laughs> trades all of that in to become a nun and then is just singing on the road tavern to tavern and uh and sword fighting for money um and even to the point where winning her first sword fight in in a tavern while people are throwing coins at her and literally are placing bets so you know they're they're sharing their winnings with her there's a a, a famous incident that i have in the book where someone insists that that she can't be a girl she's got to be a boy in disguise because girls can't fight that well. Like she can't, she can't, you know, beat five guys in a sword fight and be a girl. So she whips her breasts out. And <laughs> she's like, well, now what are you going to do? Like, you know, and it's just that sense of kind of brazen ownership of I'm here, deal with it. That just makes her such a, a an irresistible character to write. I mean, it was just that uh, uh, she takes up space. She's unapologetic, even when she is... I mean, yeah, she's messed up. She's extremely toxic. She hurts everyone who falls into her orbit in, in one way or another. But she's delightful as, as history unfolds around her. And that leads me to my next question. So she, she murders a number of people and she doesn't seem all that bothered by it. Do you think that that's, do you think she actually wasn't bothered by it? Can you talk a little bit about this aspect of her personality? Sure. I think that it's, it really comes down to, there's a there's a respect with anyone who picks up a, a weapon or anyone who picks up a sword. You know, a sword is a very specific tool. And, you know, the first thing that you learn and, and did in the era, you don't study the sword first. You study human anatomy first. And you understand that a human being is a series of systems. And a sword is a tool for turning those systems off. So a human being, you have a musculoskeletal system, you've got muscle, you've got bones, you have a respiratory system, you have lungs, you have a cardiovascular system, you have blood pumping through your heart, you have a, a neural system, you have brain, nerves, and the sword is meant to disconnect these things. Because someone is coming at you trying to disconnect your systems, and you have to turn them off you know, before they turn you off. And it really is you know, quite, quite simple. So she understands how to turn people off who are coming at her with, with sharp things. and. When she is relatively sober, she's pretty good at pulling her punches and giving somebody a slap on the ass or giving them a little scratch. And, okay, you've learned your lesson, fight is over. Um, when she's drinking, that becomes a lot harder to gauge. Mistakes happen. But, you know, if you don't want to get stabbed by me, don't come at me with a sword. And, I, you know, she doesn't stab anybody who doesn't come at her with a sword. She doesn't kill anybody out of anger. Um, she doesn't kill anybody out of malice. Yeah, she's a hothead, but people challenge her to a duel. And, you know, these are lethal weapons we're playing with. What do you think is going to happen? So 
she doesn't set out to kill anybody, but you know, they're in the context of a duel, people die in duels. And that's, that's both the reality of the day where people felt that their honor was either infringed or just for entertainment. And the duels happen and people die. And she had seen that happen her whole life. So she's just really pragmatic about it. Yeah, that makes sense. Are you searching for spiritual guidance? The Heart of You podcast is an exploration into your soul through intuition, spirituality, divination, and unconditional love. Host Annette Lu is a spiritual guidance coach, intuitive, Akashic, and tarot reader who discusses practical ways to integrate spiritual growth into your everyday life. Listen now to The Heart of You on parisundergroundradio.com or wherever you listen to podcasts. We'll be right back with Storytime in Paris after a word from our sponsors. And now, back to Storytime in Paris. I think, with all that being said, I think now might be a really good time to hear a little bit from La Maupin. Okay, great. Well, I'll set up the, the chapter, sort of midpoint in the book, where she has, uh, as I said earlier, she's become a nun to continue her love affair with this girl that, that has been stowed by her family. And without getting too spoilery, because it's well known, she and her lover set fire to the convent. It's not a very big fire. It's often described that she's just burning the place down. She didn't actually burn the place down, but she did start a fire to distract her exit. And they did steal the body of a dead nun to stick in her bed. So there she is. A, she is a grave robbing arsonist, <laughs> horse thief. But it was all for love. And anyway, just proves too much for her poor girlfriend who has a breakdown and leaves sobbing, leaving Julie in the middle of the arse end of nowhere on the road in a tavern, heartbroken, her, her lover having left her. So she is just dealing with heartache, gets drunk, picks a fight. And uh, we're there. She has left. She had nothing. So it was simple enough to leave with everything she had while I slept. Alb and scapular, veil and cross, leggings and sandals. Not a single so did she take with her. So a nun at last, I suppose. I declared war on God for her, and she wept and crept from our bed. I picture her silent, rocking on the back of a hay rig, headed away from me. The room is a disaster. Smoky candles the color of fat. The road goods still filthy, mud on the floor. My one good wig crushed to nothing, my gown stained unfit for a milkmaid. The breeches and tabard look at home here, at least, as do pistol and baldric and sword. The sword makes everything simpler. It is night again, the bells tell me, though I can still see the town below in its little circle, hemmed in by a ring of green hills. The bells call men to the tavern as much as it calls the pious to prayer. It calls the watch to their torches, and it will call the swords to me. Sore, but I have them to a man, I must confess, I am a little drunk. I am ungentle. I rebuke a sentiment with a thrust, a tip with a cut, and those I disarm are rewarded with a blow to the nose with my pommel. The blood imparts the crowd a sense of communion, and there is much wine, perhaps too much. I am fine for my part, a rolled shoulder, an extended knee which I shall feel on my buttock come morning, but I roared a challenge and they crowed like cocks and laughed with the spinning of silver to the stoddest of the piste. The tavern keeper declined to act as judge, but a portly and elderly fellow was found who had some experience, insisting dramatically that we all pray and drink to the king ahead of time. This was agreeable, particularly the drinking part. One begins with a beat and gets well within my point, although his lunge is hesitant. I slap his blade away with the flat of my other hand. My sword again on target, I let him play with it, working his way up to the hilt until he realizes that all the force is now with me, and a simple roll of my wrist has him nearly removed of his own toes with the end of his blade. He jumps back and is more cautious after that, so much so that his fellows bid him to withdraw so they could get a turn. Some come out of the gate with a flurry of wild cuts to the head, like little boys playing with sticks, stopped easy just with the ticking of a riposte, as though the sound itself was all they were seeking. Wide open, of course, through all of this. Belly and chest, heart and lung, throat and genitals, inner thigh. But their ferocious blows raining hard on the roof of battle, as they imagined it should be, and a single fist to the button of the chest, 
and there in the sawdust, wheezing and baffled. As the wine rolls in like a fog, both my technique and memory blur. The sword itself cuts through. All that remains is the familiar placement of muscle, the haze of their eyes, and two points in space. My blade, their blade, nothing else matters. It is an escape the rosary could never match in its blissful obliteration of self. The grave must be like this, I thought. Nowhere to go. No light, no music, just the minute awareness of this worm here scuttling across your ribcage to find some small incident of meat heretofore on et. One thing and one thing only, like the moments in the blonde, blonde cave of Lisette's hair in the morning or the intake of breath before entering the stage. Beautiful. Distracted, I find my blade buried in some farm boy's shoulder. He's still fighting, too hot or too drunk to realize what has happened. I rest the blade on my left shoulder and step forward, plucking his sword from his right hand with my own and dropping it, pinning his left hand to his side. Don't move, I whisper. It takes, it always takes, seconds for the crowd to become aware that the game has changed. I cannot tell if I've cut the artery under the clavicle or even nicked the upper part of the lung, which keeps it upright. Depending, he is either dead or alive and merely has yet to be informed. His compatriots clear and lower him to the table, the small sword standing in his chest like a flag. The girl brings over a lantern and a pitcher. Clearly, she is versed well enough in such things. Whiskey, I say, and linen. When the whiskey arrives, I shoot it back and demand another. The second I place on the table next to the clean enough linen, torn, I imagine, from the girl's own chemise, not filthy enough for a gown end. I dip my finger in the whiskey and pull the sword straight out, plugging the hole again with my finger as I do so. He turns green from the pain and his friends hold him down while I wiggle around a bit in the wound. A little fish hook of bone sheared off from the thrust. That would kill him if I failed to pull it out. Mercifully, my fingernail catches it and flicks it out of him with a little spray of blood. I watch the blood well in the wound, crimson and light, not too gummy, not too watery. I felt the strings of muscles that connect the lungs to the rib, resisting the temptation to strum them like a harp. I pack the linen tight into the wound, watch the red climb the little bone-white threads, the life itself escaping from him in filaments. I make the crowd silent and place my head to his chest, as I have with horses a hundred times before. Even breaths without rasping, though he is sweating in a way I do not care for. He will live. I pour the last of the whiskey over the bloodening rags in his chest and leave my winnings on the table. Call a midwife, I say, or a barber, or a seamstress. He'll live, save for any foolishness. Here in the room, I barricade the door, should he turn cold and his friends hot. I am a dangerous creature, and I can smell the fear on them. Perhaps Lisette could smell the danger on me, which first opened her to love and then shut her like a book. I must leave this place at dawn. Excellent. Thank you so much. <laughs> it's a great passage. Thanks. So what's next for you? When can we expect the third book in the series? So I have written the third book actually as a, as a comic script. Oh. And so I'm looking at the logistics of doing it as a, as a graphic novel first and then novelizing that later. But Lemo Pan came out this summer and we just released the audiobook. Um, which is available at Outland Entertainment. So yeah, I'm on to uh, I'm on to the next one. Back in the day, I was involved in women's flat track roller derby. Oh, and there is a great camaraderie around uh, women who you know, about around derby girls, and uh, you know, and it's it's a it's a great sport. It's body positive. You need to have a, a variety of athletic types, body types on a team to round it out. And, you know, it's just a great bunch of people and, and a great community of support. And there is a tradition in uh, the early Christian centuries in Rome where a female gladiators were, they were not slaves. They were girls mostly from middle class families. They were um, not fighting to the death, but they were competing largely in groups and uh, on teams. And they were really doing it for status to celebritize themselves. And while it was kind of underground, you can be very successful and really lift your social standing by by 
being on a gladiator team. And so I really kind of took my experience and women that I, I met through Derby and put them in the arena and I put them <laughs> on the sand. So uh, that's, that's the next one. Wow, that sounds fascinating. So where can people find you if they want to keep up to date with you and what you're doing and your new books and all of that? Yeah, my out of date uh, website is at jordanstratfordbooks.com, but the Sword Girl series is available at outlandentertainment.com. Perfect. And I'll include links so that people can find you and your books very easily. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Jordan. This was wonderful. Thank you so much for talking with me. This is great. This has been really fun. Thank you so much. Thank you again to Jordan Stratford for such an interesting conversation. You can find Jordan on his website, jordanstratfordbooks.com, and his Sword Girl series is available at outlandentertainment.com. Please join me next week when I'll be speaking with author Catherine J. Chen about her book, Joan, a novel of Joan of Arc. Check back to see if your questions have been answered and to hear a reading from her book. Join our book club. The Storytime Book Club welcomes authors who have been featured on this podcast to come talk more in depth about their books. Since we keep the podcast spoiler free, this is the perfect chance to get all your specific questions answered. Our next guest will be season premiere guest Kate Reardon discussing her book, The Heat Wave. For more information, including sign up, please join us on Patreon at patreon.com slash Paris Underground Radio. I'm your host, Jennifer Garrity. You can find me on all socials at Jenny Foria. That's J-E-N-N-Y. P-H-O-R-I-A. Thank you for listening, and until next time, happy reading! This episode of Storytime in Paris was produced by Jennifer Garrity for Paris Underground Radio. For more on this show and shows like it, please visit parisundergroundradio.com.